Two brand new shows from the world of DC Comics, a new comedy on Fox, and three kind of bizarre reality type competition shows, and a lot of renewals as well. Let's talk TV. Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews It, and welcome to TV News and Reviews for the week. A lot of things to discuss in the world of television. Um, in fact, a ton of renewals and, and cancellations to talk about in the news, um, so we're probably going to start there. But uh, a bunch of great new shows to talk about, uh, and by great, well, we'll see, but certainly shows that are being talked about. Peacemaker on HBO Max and Naomi on The CW, both part of the DC Universe, pivoting over on Fox, which is a new comedy, and then uh, The Return of Joe Millionaire, uh, the new show with uh, Gordon Ramsay, Next Level Chef, and Hype House over on Netflix about uh, all the TikTok influencers uh, of the day. So let's first get into the renewals and the cancellations because there's a ton of them. We sort of skipped over this part last week because I wanted to talk about some other things. So we're just going to kind of run down these very quickly. Uh, Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy both renewed on ABC. Their Thursday night lineup staying steady. Station, six, uh, Station 19 for season six already, believe it or not. And Grey's Anatomy for season 19. They keep saying, oh, well, maybe this will be their last year, but then um, Meredith Grey keeps keeps on renewing. So, and, and, you know, why not? It's easy money. She's one of the highest paid actresses uh, on television. So, uh, all right. The Great for season three at Hulu for 10 episodes. This is a very popular show. Season two, I think, just ended uh, a month or two ago. But uh, I know people that love that show. So that will be returning for season three. Uh, the Morning Show for season three at Apple Plus. I love that one. So I'm excited about that. I thought season two was even better than season one. I think they're really building on something there, so love that. Uh, Emily in Paris for seasons three and four on Netflix. Now, that's big because Netflix usually will drop a show uh, after three seasons if they don't feel like it's uh, doing that well or if it's going to bring new subscribers in. But obviously, they're very happy with the Emily in Paris. Listen to this. So um, the, the the second season just happened like three weeks ago, but um, Netflix says the, the brand new season topped its global top 10 in 94 countries with 107.6 million hours viewed in the first five days. So it makes sense that they would be bringing this back for two more seasons. Season one ranked as its most viewed comedy of 2020. That also makes sense and uh, topped the global list across 53 countries. So obviously they've got a hit on their hands. I thought the show was... Uh, pretty average. I really think I gave it like a C or a C plus. Um, but it was Golden Globe nominated. People do seem to enjoy it. Um, so there you go. All right. Watch what happens on Bravo renewed through 2023, which would be season 15 for the show. It was uh, the highest rated late night talker on uh, ad supported cable in the top demo. So I guess that would be like the daily show would be included in that. The Samantha B show, um, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, and actually it was, it was the top rated talker in the 18 to 49 demo for the first time ever this past season. So I, I would assume the daily show usually would take that. Um, but yeah, this, this time it's watch what happens. So obviously they're happy with that. Godfather of Harlem renewed for season three on epics. Uh, I, I have not kept up with this show. Um, but I watched about half of the first season really enjoyed it um and i know that always gets you know some awards love as well with Forrest whitaker at the helm so uh that's good star trek uh strange new worlds uh is <laughs> didn't even premiere yet but they've already renewed it for season two so the premiere of that's going to be may 5th and they also announced uh, discovery will return february 10th and picard returns march 3rd and they've released a uh, trailer for picard season two and Whoopi Goldberg appears in the trailer uh, as Guinan, her old character from Next Generation. So I don't know if she's going to be uh, doing like a one one shot thing or if she's going to have like a multi episode arc like Jerry Ryan did as Seven of Nine in season one. I did watch all of season one of Picard. Really, really good stuff if you're a Star Trek fan. Um, but anyway, they've, they've already renewed the new series, Strange New Worlds, even though it will not premiere yet for another couple of months. So obviously they're behind that. Um, and then CBS renewing their, uh, I guess their whole comedy lineup now that I'm thinking about it. But Ghosts renewed for season two at CBS, Bob Hart's Abishola and The Neighborhood returning as well. 
Um, and the four, if you combine them with Young Sheldon, are the, the most watched comedies on television. So that goes, you know, above the Connors, the Wonder Years, um, you know, anything on uh, Fox, I guess, The Simpsons. So Young Sheldon, that's no surprise because, of course, Big Bang Theory was so huge. And, and Young Sheldon now is in syndication. So people are maybe discovering it that weren't watching it previously. Um, so that's that's obviously doing really well. But, yeah, it's kind of cool. Ghost Neighborhood and Bob Hearts Abishola are all falling in, in the, that line with uh, the, the top four comedies. I still don't really like Bob Hart's Have a Show. I gave it two chances. I reviewed it for you guys and gave it like a D plus. And then my one buddy was like, oh, it's really funny. Like you should you should keep up with it. So I watched the first two episodes again. And I was like, yeah, I, I this is not for me. I don't like this show. But I love The Neighborhood. I think The Neighborhood's really funny. So that's good. And, and Ghosts was on my uh, top 25 of the year. So obviously I, I enjoyed that one as well. So, um, all right. And then this is not specifically about... Um, renewals but uh, an uptick in episodes to complete the season so abc has ordered um more episodes of the goldbergs home economics and the wonder years uh, and they're all going to end at 22 episodes for this season which i think at this point is the most you can expect some maybe still get 24 but i don't think so i think the last show that maybe got regularly 24 episodes in a season was like modern family and big bang theory probably I think most shows now will get between 20 and 22 for a full, complete season. That includes the dramas, um, which makes sense because shows are expensive. And, you know, with, with cable and streaming only doing like 10 episodes, you're still, you know, doubling that. So, but uh, we, I, I like those shows, so 22 episodes there. All right, a few shows ending. Uh, Bull is finally done at CBS. They had the, that controversy a couple of years ago with uh, the lead actor, I think his name is Michael Weatherly, maybe. Um, but there was some sexual uh, assault allegations against him, and they kept the show on for a couple more years, which was a little surprising for me. But uh, the current season, season six, will be the end of Bull on CBS. Uh, 60 Minutes Plus is over at Paramount Plus. Um, that was originally going to be on Quibi, and then that, that thing dissolved. So they, they ported 60 Minutes Plus over to Paramount Plus. I thought it was uh, fine. I watched it uh, so I could review it for you guys. It was, you know, good news show, but uh, that is over. And then uh, The Lost Symbol, done after season one on Peacock. I didn't really care for that, so no love lost there. Um, and then a couple of game shows done at NBC. Small Fortune, uh, which, and these are both done done. There's There will be no new episodes. Small Fortune ran last summer, I think. Um, with Lil Rel Howery as the host. That is done after one season. And then Ellen's Game of Games ran four seasons. The last uh, new episodes were in May of last year, and those will now be the last episodes ever of that show. Ellen's Game of Games is done. It had season. Uh, it had four seasons, though, so a pretty good run uh, for a game show. All right, so what else can we talk about? There's still so much news um, that, uh, you know, I think we're not even going to get to all of it this week, but a couple of casting things I saw. Uh, Sharon Stone is going to be coming on for season two of The Flight Attendant. She's going to be the mom to uh, Kaylee Cuoco's Cassie character. Uh, and the two in, in the story have been estranged for some time. And after years of dealing with Cassie's alcoholism, uh, her mom would prefer to, to stay with her and, and try to take care of her. So that will be season two. Um, other recurring performers in that will be Cheryl Hines and Margaret Cho, two people I really enjoy. So they're all coming on board uh, in some sort of capacity for season two of Flight Attendant. Aubrey Plaza and Michael Imperioli, formerly of The Sopranos, join season two of The White Lotus. Um, it's going to feature another Lotus Resort in a different location than season one. I never finished season one, but apparently it is really good. So I'm going to have to, I think I think there's only eight episodes maybe, and I watched three. So I'll have to watch the rest of those. But uh, Jennifer Coolidge's character is likely to return, apparently. Um, I, I guess she is, I mean, uh, with, with her character for the first episode, or for the first season, it does kind of make sense. Because she, she would sort of travel to the different resorts and just be, uh, you know... A, a woman always vacationing and that sort of thing. So I think it makes sense for her character to return. And she was certainly a fan favorite. So that makes sense. Um, Dom Nall Gleason is going to join FX's 10 episode miniseries, The Patient. This is a show that stars Steve Carell as Alexander Strauss, who is a psychotherapist who finds himself held prisoner by a serial killer. And now we know that killer will be played by Dom Nall Gleason, who has been in a bunch of stuff, you know, back in the Harry Potter days. 
and he was been in he's been in Star Wars. He's been done a ton of movies, um, so we like him. And um, all right, P uh, Perry Mason is coming back for season two, which I I guess I blocked out or something. I think I did report on that when it happened, but I don't care about that show. Um, but kind of interesting uh, of of the people they're adding to season two: Sean Astin, who we all know, uh, Tommy Dewey, who is part of the ensemble cast in the new show Pivoting. I'm going to review today. And then Paul Racy, who was Oscar nominated for uh, my number one movie of 2019, The Sound of Metal, or 2020, I guess I should say. Um, and so, you know, not I'm, I'm probably not going to watch Perry Mason again. I thought that that first uh, season was pretty lame. But uh, anyway, some interesting casting choices there for season two. Uh, all right. And what else can we talk about? I guess uh, we'll just do reboots and spinoffs and then move into our reviews. Uh, so Food Network staple Iron Chef is coming to Netflix with an eight episode order in late 2022. It's going to be called Iron Chef Quest for an Iron Legend. Now, I am not uh, much of a food competition watcher, uh, and you'll hear me say that again probably when we talk about the new Gordon Ramsay show. Um, but this was one of the first. I mean, this dates back to, I believe the international version of Iron Chef was like in the early 90s, and then it came to America in maybe 97 or 98. So it's it's been one of, one of the longer standing uh, cooking shows. So, uh, you know, of course, Netflix is bringing it back. And they do have a few interesting cooking competition shows on there. Um, I've seen a couple of them that I've reviewed for you, and I don't think I've given any of them a negative grade. Uh, oh, well, okay. There was the one I refused to watch, Cooking with Paris Hilton, but that wasn't really a competition show. That was just dumb, dumb Paris, you know, learning how to cook an egg or whatever. Um, so I, I watched the first, like, four minutes of that, and I was like, I can't, I can't get through this. So, uh, <laughs> so I never ended up reviewing it. But uh, And then Apple TV Plus has partnered with Legendary uh, Film Studios for a new original live action show based on the creatures from Godzilla and the ensuing monster verse that Legendary has. So, you know, I guess that's, I don't think it's, it includes King Kong, but um, I think, you know, Mothra and, and all the people that, that populate the Godzilla franchises. I, I suppose they could throw in King Kong as part of it, but the, in the article, it didn't mention anything about King Kong. So I'm going to say it's probably more you know, uh, not with that and, and focus just on the Godzilla people, but I guess you never know. They do certainly own the rights to King Kong, so um, that's why we had that movie last year. So we'll see. Although, I don't know, I feel like that was a Warner Brothers Pictures film, though. So um, Legendary may own Godzilla and Warner Brothers may own King Kong. I'm not really sure. Um, but in any event, so that will be uh, coming to Apple TV+. Plus. All right, so uh, a couple of things maybe I'll save for next time uh, if they're important enough, but Let's get into the reviews, shall we? We've got six for you this week. Um, and usually the reality type ones, the competition type ones, uh, I don't take too long to discuss. So I think those will be kind of quick at the end. But uh, first, we're going to talk about Peacemaker. This is certainly the most talked about show of the week. John Cena is the star here. And this is based on his character from the Suicide Squad film, uh, which was a big hit last year. Well, I mean, it wasn't a big hit at the box office, but a ton of people watched it on HBO Max, and critically, it was a success, uh, unlike the Suicide Squad movie that came out a few years previous. Um, but uh, this is written completely by James Gunn, who wrote and directed... Uh, I don't know if he wrote the Suicide Squad, but he certainly directed it. Um, and we know him from, you know, the Guardians movies, and, and he's really... He's very, very talented in that whole realm of superhero stuff. Um, but this essentially takes place after the Suicide Squad, and not to go into spoilers for that movie, but um, they give you a real nice, like, two and a half minute recap of that film and Peacemaker's character in it. Um, so I, I, well, I'm not going to say it. I, you know, if you didn't see the movie, I think you should watch it because it was really, really good. It was among my top uh, probably 20 of last year. I still haven't put that list together yet, but um, I gave it an A minus, you know, a lot of good stuff in that movie. So um, I I'm not going to spoil it, but the first two and a half minutes of this gives you, you know, a a an overview, which honestly, I think more shows based on, you know, spinoff type material should do that. Book of Boba Fett should have given us a, you know, previously on The Mandalorian, you know, or whatever. Um, same with, you know, some of the Marvel shows, perhaps, that, that just don't. This gave us right away... Previously in the Suicide Squad, 
boom. And then literally, I, I, I clocked it. I think it was two, two minutes and 18 seconds or something like that was the recap. So they told you a lot. They told you everything you need to know to get situated. So this takes place after that, after recovering from uh, some injuries he sustained during that uh, movie. So Christopher Smith, Smith slash Peacemaker uh, is forced to join the mysterious Argus Black Ops project called Project Butterfly. And uh, they're on a, minute, a mission to identify and eliminate parasitic butterfly-like creatures, but that take human form uh, from taking over and destroying the world. So James Gunn, um, like I said, wrote all of these episodes. He's directed at least the first three. Um, the couple that are listed here on Wiki after that, um, he directed episodes six and eight as well. So he directed five of the eight episodes, um, but they're releasing these week after week on HBO Max. So currently, uh, I guess as of maybe tonight, there's five episodes up, uh, but I watched uh, the first two of these and um, this uh, this show has a lot of that same quality that the Suicide Squad had. A lot of fun. Sometimes maybe a little too clever for uh, its own good. Maybe a little more clever than it thinks it is sometimes. But uh, the cast here is is pretty solid. You've got uh, this... I mean, I recognize her from a couple things, but I'm not sure where. But Danielle Brooks plays... Um, the daughter of the Viola Davis character, Amanda Waller, from the Suicide Squad films. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, a, a bunch of people that, that are sort of new. You know, I don't really recognize a lot of them, but they sort of make up the, the Argus agents. You know, Jennifer Holland is one of them. Steve Agee is one of them. Don't really know. But Robert Patrick, you might know him from uh, different things. He plays um, Peacemaker's racist father. Um, who is helping with the mission uh, in, in that regard. It's a little hard to get behind this character um, because he is, uh, you know, yeah, it's it's one of those characters where, like, maybe he can wring some laughs from being racist, but when, while you're laughing, you're like, oh, that's not, that's really not appropriate, you know? Um, it, it's one of those, like, oh, he's old school racist, so I guess it's okay, he doesn't really mean it kind of thing, but, like, but but uh, they released a statement, or John Cena did, I guess, in an interview, saying that this is the one character of the show that, that does not change. He has no arc, you know, whatever. And that, to me, I'm like, Ugh, okay, I thought we were sort of done with the Archie Bunker stereotype 40 years ago, you know. Um, we like we like our races to change these days, right? So, I don't know, maybe if we get a season two of Peacemaker, that something will happen with that. Uh, so I didn't love that character. But, look, this show goes all in on everything that James Gunn uh, made the Suicide Squad good with. You know, that sentence structure was bad, but you know what I mean. James Gunn really, uh, he wrote this during the pandemic. Makes sense, nothing else to do. Um, and called up John Cena and was like, hey, do you want to, you know, reprise your role? And he was like, um, pretty sure something happened to the Suicide Squad that that's not going to really be happening. And he was like, let me take care of that for you. Um, so they did that. And uh, John Cena is having a blast. I think John Cena is very likable. Um, I I don't know if I think he has more range than Dwayne Johnson. Because um, I don't think Dwayne Johnson has a lot of range. I think he's good at what he does. His lane is great. Um, but he doesn't really veer from that. And I feel like John Cena is kind of in that vein right now from the roles he's been, you know, given. Um, I don't know, though. He could possibly bust out of that shell and do something that surprises us but here he is you know and, and look it's it's not a bad lane to be in it's 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 you know likable characters the hero um you know the the tongue-in-cheek witty guy it, it it all works certainly for this character um so i'm not slagging on that at all but i i would like to see at some point john cena sort of bust out from that to see if he could do it because i think maybe he could um but the the theme song alone is like an A+. Plus. They did a theme song here where there's this like really sort of corny dance and it's very funny. Um, and so I, I like that part about it. But uh, I would say really the only negatives are the same negatives that I had about the Suicide Squad movie is that, you know, sometimes I, th I think it's a little too clever for its own good. It, it thinks it's a lot more clever than it is sometimes. Um, you know, every character has, you know, pithy comebacks. It's like, okay, you know, sometimes you do need a, a straight man to the, the comedy, but uh, I think John Cena kills this. I think he's hilarious in it, um, and, and I'm excited to see where the, where the show goes from here. And yeah, the theme song is absolutely brilliant. It really sets you right in to the mood of the show. 
um, which I think is important. It's something that, that honestly we've lost in broadcast television because there are no theme songs anymore for the most part. Um, but with, with the advent of streaming, we're allowed to do, you know, shows as long or as little as we want. So the runtime for these shows are like all over the place, like 42 minutes, 45 minutes, 38 minutes. Um, so they just fill it as they need. So a theme song, sure, why not? You know, let's do it. So I, I love the theme song. Uh, I give Peacemaker an A-. minus. So right there with the Suicide Squad movie for me. Uh, which, you know, Peacemaker was not my favorite character in the Suicide Squad. So I, I was not sure how I would feel about that uh, as a show, but I, I, I really like it. Uh, so up next, we're going to move over to the CW, another DC Comics-based show called Naomi. They are, of course, the home for the DC shows. They do the whole Arrowverse over there. Um, and then they have, like, Bat, they have Bat Girl, uh, which I think is not even really a part of the Arrowverse. I guess sort of is, but I, I don't know, whatever. I, I can't keep up. I can't follow it. Um, but I do know Naomi is a DC comic, but a relatively new one. Um, like Peacemaker, for example, started way back when in, I think the first DC Comics imprint of Peacemaker was the 90s. Um, but Naomi is only a few years old as a character. So, um, you know, that's that, that speaks, I think, a little bit to... Um, uh, not necessarily the grasping at straws for characters, but I feel like the CW has tackled a lot of some of the classics, and now they're sort of picking some of the, the more obscure ones. And that can certainly work. You know, Marvel did it with Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant-Man and stuff like that. Um, but here, I, I feel like Naomi's entire sort of uh, presence is to uh, to be woke, and they created this comic to, like, have more diversity and stuff and i feel like a lot of the dc shows do have the diversity already so i'm not sure that you necessarily you know needed to pull this particular character um but she is a little bit interesting in the fact that she um well she sort of becomes a superhero but she is um a comic book super fan who hosts this superman you know fan website and she just loves Superman. And so we get her into the world that way, which I do think is actually interesting. Um, and so this big supernatural event occurs in Oregon where, where her and her family are located. And so she's got to figure out, uh, you know, what what she can do uh, to be a part of that. You know, she, she realizes she has some powers and, and we go from there. So K Casey Walfall uh, plays Naomi McDuffie. Um, and then I, I honestly don't know anybody from this show. All, all the names, you know, Alexander Wraith, Mary Charles Jones, Cranton Johnston, like, oh, you know, what, I don't know what kind of names these are, but, uh, Cranston, I've, I've heard that as the last name, Brian Cranston, but Cranston Johnson, it's an interesting name. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, I don't really know any of these people. So I sort of went into this blind. I don't even know this character. Um, and it turns out the show is, uh, only kind of average, like a lot of the CW shows. I thought with the premise, maybe it would be a little more interesting, but it's, uh, it's typical sort of high school CW stuff. Everybody's gorgeous. Everybody's uh, got their own little, you know, high school problems. Um, uh, I will say that unlike some of the other CW Arrowverse shows where people are more grown up, I do think this could potentially serve as a decent high school drama series in addition to the superhero stuff in due time. I'm not quite sure the first episode gave us a lot of that, but, you know, there's like a, a, a debate team uh, competition in there, and there's like, a you know, some, some romance stuff. So I think if they sort of lean into that a little bit more, you could have uh, something a, a little bit more special than, than it is or than it appears to be from the pilot. Um, and, and the gal playing Naomi is fine. Um, you know, she didn't strike me as anything particularly that special, but she does a good job with, you know, the, the material. And like all the CW actresses, like I said, she's, you know, gorgeous and uh, all of that. So overall, I, I thought this was uh, an okay foray into this character. Um, for a character I didn't know, I will admit I was more intrigued uh, than I thought I was going to be. Um, but it's still at the end of the day, a CW show, it leans into a lot of those kind of tropes. Um, so I, I can't grade it too high. I would love for the CW to step out of their comfort zone, but look, it works for them. They get hardly no ratings on the air, but on streaming and on, on, uh, the, the, the CW app and stuff after the fact, they get a ton of views. So I guess it, it's worth it for them to keep churning these shows out. 
Um, but they do end up seeming like just a dime a dozen. So I leave Naomi with a C. Uh, if they lean in a little bit more with that high school stuff, I, I think you could see something a little bit different for them. Uh, and maybe, you know, C plus, B minus could be in the future, but um, I I'm not going to stick around and watch. But I think that's sort of the way to go for, for this show at this point. All right, Pivoting is next. This is over on Fox. It is uh, a comedy with uh, three lead women, Eliza Coop, formerly of Happy Endings, Jennifer Goodwin from Big Love, and Maggie Q from a bunch of movies, and not really a lot of comedy. We have not seen her do comedy thus far, um, that I can remember anyway, but uh, the, their their friend Colleen dies the very uh, beginning of the first episode. We see that sort of off screen. We, we start at the funeral of Colleen in the, in the pilot, uh, and these, these ladies decide that uh, life is too short, and they need to pivot their lives in new directions um, and each try and, you know, make different choices. So Maggie Q, for example, is a surgeon who uh, decides that that it's too stressful, especially, you know, with everything going on. They don't necessarily talk about COVID, I don't think, but I, I sort of got the sense that that was sort of part of her, like, you know, I need to get out of this biz. Um, so she becomes a cashier at a grocery store. Uh, Jennifer Goodwin is, you know, this mother of three who is sort of unhappy in her marriage and, you um, you know, develops a bit of a crush on her uh, fitness instructor. And then Eliza Coop is a local mo morning talk show producer that, uh, you know, is letting her kids basically be raised by nannies during the day because she doesn't want anything to do with them. And she decides to attempt, uh, you know, being a good mother. Um, and then Tommy Dewey, like I mentioned, um, that's going to be in season two of Perry Mason. He plays uh, Amy's husband, who is Eliza Coop's character. So um, this... I had high expectations going into because I like all three of these actresses. Specifically, anybody from Happy Endings, I will, you know, uh, watch their show, at least give it the old college try for a few episodes. Uh, I watched the first two episodes of Pivoting. Um, I, I do think the ladies have good chemistry together. I, I will say that. And uh, Maggie Q, I shouldn't be surprised because she can, you know, do it all. We love her. Um, but she is pretty adept at comedy. She's pretty funny here. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think, at least in these first two episodes, we've stepped out of the, the very, very basic, okay, this is the box we're putting this person in, this is the box for this person. Um, we have yet to sort of develop any of these characters after two full episodes. Um, so I, I want to see this show grow a little bit more. And look, a lot of comedies have that issue. You know, I felt the same way about Mr. Mayor last year with Ted Danson. Um, it's hard to do a really good comedy pilot where you sort of, you know, everybody gets established. Every, you know, I, I thought Happy Endings had a great one. Uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll say that. Um, 30 Rock is another one that comes to mind. But most sitcom pilots, you do need two or three episodes to, to kind of get to know the characters. Um, but it can certainly be done. Um, this, though, I, I don't think quite hit that mark. Um, but I did laugh a few times. One of my issues is nobody seems to be a good person. <laughs> Everybody, Maggie Q, maybe, but uh, nobody really seems to have a good heart. And I do have a bit of an issue with that. Um, so I'd like to see that sort of change as the episodes go on. Um, but like I said, anybody from Happy Endings, I will give their show at least, you know, the old college try five, six episodes maybe um, before I decide to, to bail on it. And I don't usually bail because I, I love the, those shows. But um I think this has a lot of growing to do. I'll say that. It's not bad necessarily yet, but uh, I need to see these characters grow a little more, A, out of their boxes, and B, just in the heart a little bit. I need this show to have a little more heart, um, you know, and, and there are shows certainly with no heart, always sunny in Philadelphia, but, um, but that's written way, way better than this. So, you know, sort of, sort of a give and take there. So I'm going to leave pivoting with a B minus. I, I don't think it is bad, but, um, it needs to definitely grow in, in some areas. All right. So now we're going to move over two more on Fox, by the way, uh, we're going to move over to the, uh, more reality type shows. We'll start with next level chef, uh, with Gordon Ramsay. And then uh, there's these two other judges, Naisha Arrington and Richard Blaze. Um, who were part of Top Chef. They were contestants on Top Chef, which I've never seen, so I had to look that up. I, I'm not familiar with these two people at all, but of course I know Gordon Ramsay, even though I don't really watch any of his shows. But um, this is an interesting one, you know? How, how do we make another cooking competition with Gordon Ramsay and make it, uh, you know, a little different? And I think they've certainly done that. So the next level in the title uh, speaks to the three levels of the kitchen. So there's the basement, 
the mid level and then I forget what they call the top level, but you know, the whatever, the, the top level. Um, and basically 15 chefs uh, are, are, are in the, the series and five each are on uh, each different level. And they're all mentored. Each level is mentored by a different judge. I think that's going to be chosen at random every week. But basically, um, you know, they all sort of, they didn't get to pick their own level, but they, they picked a card and then, you know, that group was in whatever area. So the top level stuff has like the cream of the crop, you know, the best meats and vegetables and the best, you know, cooking utensils and all of that stuff. Middle row is like an everyday kitchen, things that most normal chefs or restaurants would have. And then the basement is, you know, bottom of the barrel stuff. And there's like a conveyor belt that like goes down. And so the top people go first, then the next people get to pick, you know, what's left over from that. And then the bottom people get to pick sort of, the, you know, the, the basement of, of the stuff. But then they have to, you know, cook whatever uh, dish. And, you know, if you cook something great from the basement, that's going to make you look superior as a chef, right? So then at the end of the first episode, uh, each chef or each judge, I should say, picked their teams. Um, I kind of like this. I'm not a... Uh, a, a cooking show watcher. I uh, I did really enjoy Celebrity, uh, or I keep calling it Celebrity, but Crime Scene Kitchen. I love that show. Um, but other than that, you know, not not totally plugged in with that universe. Um, this show, though, oh, it made everything look so good. I think part of the reason I don't watch shows like this is because I know I don't want to go out and spend ninety dollars on uh, that plate, you know. But um, but man, they made some good stuff in this first episode. Ooh, loved it. Um, so certainly it's appealing to look at. Uh, and I do like the concept. I think it's very interesting. Um, and then I, I sort of don't know how much I love the uh, the gym class style picking of the, the contestants at the end of the episode. But for a show like this, it makes sense. Unlike gym class where there was, you know, no stakes. You just felt like garbage afterwards. Um, you know, people picking in this way i think for this show does make sense um one thing that i really hated and i'm sure this is pretty standard in a lot of cooking shows but the use of the word chef every sentence ends with chef 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 and not only are the contestants calling the judges chef but the judges are then calling the contestants chef back so it's like Okay, chef, you know, what'd you use here? Well, chef, I use, and I want, at the end of the episode, I was like, okay, we get it. You're all chefs, you know? And I know in a kitchen, you you have to say chefs and like, what, I, I get it. Um, <laughs> but like, it, to me, it would be like on The Voice if, you know, all the singers, uh, instead of calling their coaches, you know, Kelly Clarkson or, or, you know, Blake Shelton, they called them all freaking, you know, coach. Well, coach, you know, here's what I think. But not only that, then the coaches called them singer you know back instead of the name instead of you know debbie they say okay singer well you know i'm sure it is so standard in chef competition shows i got it but um it was very irritating to me so i have to talk it a little bit uh, for that but i do like the concept here um you know gordon ramsay i feel like has softened a little bit in his older age i know he, when he came on the scene you know 20 years ago he was like the screaming guy and he you know, yelled at everybody. I think doing the kids show maybe softened him a little bit. Uh, but I enjoyed the concept of this a lot. Um, I don't think I have enough time in my life to keep up with it, but it is one that uh, I think is interesting enough. I certainly would. Um, I might watch another couple episodes. I don't know. See if I really hook into these contestants. But uh, the dishes they made, oh, man, they looked good. I got I got to give it to him. And another interesting part before I grade it um, is that they're, they're uh, chefs from all over like all walks of life. Some are actually restaurant chefs. Um, and some are, I, I forget what the second category was, but then th the third category is just like home chefs, like people that cook for their families. Um, and so it, you get a diverse group as well, um, which, which I kind of appreciate. And that's sort of like the voice too. Sometimes they'll have like somebody who had like minor success 15 years ago, you know, on, on the club scene or something, you know, versus, somebody who just sings in the shower, you know, so it's that kind of, kind of concept, but I, I like that too. So overall, I, I did enjoy this show, but all the chef, 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 that's got to go for me, but I know that it won't. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to leave next level chef with a B plus, uh, Joe millionaire is next. This is, uh, the, the new version of Joe millionaire. It's sort of the, the spinoff. It's called for richer or poorer. Um, and this is basically 
the concept of Joe Millionaire when they first did it 20 years ago was that uh, the ladies were all duped. They said this guy was a millionaire, but it was just a bold-faced lie. He wasn't. Um, and so then they did a second one, but they had to take it overseas because everybody in America already knew it was such, it was such a phenomenon 20 years ago. Like everybody knew about it. So you couldn't really do it again. Um, so now they've, they've, the twist on it is there's one Joe there. I don't think either of them are actually called Joe, but, um, yeah, uh, Kurt Sowers and Stephen McBree. Um, one actually is a millionaire, um, that, uh, is a CEO and the other one um, is a construction manager. Uh, or I guess they're both CEOs, really, but one's a farmer and one's a construction manager. Anyway, one is rich and one is not so much. Um, I guess the farmer probably not so much, right? Um, but in any event, I didn't pay attention enough uh, because these guys look so similar and, and, and unappealing to me. Um, this show is the epitome of trash TV. It is garbage. Um, first of all, the, the guys don't even look that good. Like, look, the typical hot guy on TV, um, is not really my sort of taste anyway, but at least like when I look at The Bachelor or something, I could be like, okay, that dude's, you know, hot, good, you know, good face. Like I could see why that person is classically attractive. These guys, I mean, they look okay, I guess, but the only real difference is like one's clean, cleaner shaven and the other one's got a bit of a beard, but the beard guy has like a man bun that's hideous. I hate a man bun. Um, and they just look very basic and generic. So I guess the only point of these women being on the show is, oh, you know, one of these guys is rich, so maybe I'll get rich off one of them. Um, it's, it's garbage. Everybody on this show, I just want to punch in the face. And look, I've reviewed some dating shows since I started doing this. I don't watch dating shows ever, really, and I've not kept up with any of them, but I've watched a few to review them for you guys. You know, Love is Blind was the one, um, Too Hot to Handle, Flirty Dancing. You know, I've, I've seen my my uh, my fair share. Uh, the the Nikki, what was the Nikki Glaser one? F-Boy Island. Um, this is the worst of all of them. This is the epitome of trash television. I want to punch every person on the show, women and, and, and the Joes alike. Um, I, I give this an F. I mean, I, I, could, I could barely make it through. This is so, so lousy. Um, I don't know why they, they brought this concept back even. All right, so uh, fine. I told you some of these would be quick. Uh, the last one is Hype House. This is on Netflix. Um, and this is based on a, a group of content creators who uh, make TikTok videos and uh, they live in this house together. Now, here's what I didn't know going into this show. I didn't realize that the Hype House already existed. This is a house that is real, um, that you know people live in, that make content, and they make it together. And there, when I read some of the names that came out of the Hype House, they're names I, I recognize. Charlie D'Amelio, Addison Rae. Um, so I was like, okay. So I actually know those people, um, and that's interesting because I never heard of this Hype House. I thought when I read about the, the thing. I thought that, you know, the producers were specifically creating this house a la the real world or something and getting, you know, a handful of content creators that are popular and putting them in it. No, this is a house that already existed that curates content. Um, so it's a little bit of a different twist than I thought, which I kind of liked um, because I thought I would hate this. I don't, I mean, I do have a TikTok, but I don't do anything with it. I have it so I can see my nephew's TikToks. But, um, but I, I honestly think TikTok is a huge waste of time. I think it's, you know, I, and look, whatever, it's fine. Here I am, you know, reviewing shows on broadcast television. Um, you know, so who, who's uh, old school here? Me. But, um, but I just, I, I think TikTok is, can be creative. Certainly people can be creative on it. But I just, if I, if I got into it, I think I would get sucked into it and waste hours and hours a day on it. And I just, can't let myself do that, so I just don't. Um, I, I feel like it's a time suck, you know? But it was interesting. I thought these people would all be just sort of, you know, airhead dummies and, oh, you know, I, uh, I got to get my followers and whatever. But they actually, like, in the interview process uh, of, of, like, the Talking Head clips, it was interesting um, listening to these people talk about um, – the actual, you know, the real pressure to deliver for your 12 million followers, you know, whatever, and be creative and be clever um, and stuff like that. And then at the same time, you know, a couple of them had talked about, well, this is the, you know, the cancel culture era. 
and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to get caught, you know, doing something wrong, you know, or, or film something, you know, that, that I, you know, don't, don't know is offensive or whatever. I thought that stuff was actually kind of interesting. Um, so I have to say I, I got, I wouldn't say hooked on the show, but I certainly, um, got a little more attached to it than I thought I would from the concept. I debated even watching. It. I was like, this sounds stupid. But uh, it was getting some good traction on Netflix. I think it was in their top 10 for a few days. So I was like, all right, I may as well check this out. And um, I, I did not hate it. I don't think it's good. I think everybody here, you know, is sort of, um, you know, look, they're living for their content. They're living for, you know, what, what's that next like? Uh, or what's the, you know, how many likes is that next video going to get me? And how many follows and, and whatever? Uh, you know, look, but as a YouTube content creator, I actually get it. You know, I've been trying to get to a thousand subscribers and I know that's nothing, you know, that's a drop in the bucket for a lot of these people, you know, with, with five plus million to 12 plus million viewers. But, you know, it is a little bit of a struggle, you know, to come up with, with new content and stuff. So I sort of stay in my lane, do the reviews and, and that's that. But, um, these people are very clever. I'll give them that, you know, they, they've certainly captured something uh, inside people that, uh, they want to see. So I don't know. I, I, I thought this would be, you know, another like deer and F. I watched it right after Joe Millionaire and I thought, oh man, this is going to be another really bad one. It, it really wasn't. I mean, once you sort of get past initially getting to know these people, it does sort of become, okay, now they're just creating content. I'm sort of bored with this part, but I liked sort of the, the interview portion of it where we were learning a little bit about these people and their upbringings and that kind of stuff. So I, I'm going to leave Hype House with a C. I, I think it, it could certainly have been a lot worse than I was expecting worse. So sometimes you get surprised. Uh, all right, that will do it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, a ton of shows have premiered, I know, in, in this month that we still have not gotten to, How I Met Your Father. We're going to do that next week. Um, I think there's, uh, is it on Amazon? Has this show, The Way I See It, that's getting a lot of buzz. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, and, and many, many other shows, a lot of uh, things to discuss. So we'll do all of that next week. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see everybody next time. Bye.